you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to be looking in verses 12 through 21 today. As we turn there, we think about tomorrow, Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a day uh, where we should remember it every day, the sacrifice of those who have given their life for us, but oftentimes we need a day to help us collect our thoughts, a day to gather our minds together and remember those who gave their life for us. And in the same way that we need a day to remember and pull us and our focus back on what it should be on, 2 Peter, in this book, Peter writes to Christians and he asks them to remember, to remember the gospel and to remember that Christ will return one day. I'd like to read beginning with verse 12 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ may be clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you now, I pray that you would help us to remember. Help us to be reminded of the glorious truth of the gospel, that there is grace upon grace upon grace in Jesus Christ. And not only do you give us grace and salvation from our sins, But Lord, you give us everything we need for life and godliness. That Lord, you did not leave us to live this Christian life alone, but you are with us, that you care for us. Lord, I pray that you would speak through your word today, that you would guide us in truth and help us to focus our eyes and remember that Christ will return one day for us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what... Peter is writing about that Jesus is coming back and we need to remember that Jesus will return. And it leaves us a question. If Jesus is coming back one day, then how should I live? If Jesus is coming back, if he's really going to return, then how should I live? How would you want Jesus to find you if he came back today or tomorrow? There's some different scenarios for which that could happen. He could come back and he could find us in our sin. Choosing to disobey, to spurn his love and his grace, and to just go our own path and do what we want to do. He could come back and find us in that way. He could also come back and he could find us overwhelmed, anxious, worried, fearful with all the anxieties and pressures in this life. But I pray as we look at this text today... That when Jesus comes back, he would find us making every effort to know Jesus and to make him known. I think that's what Peter is encouraging the Christians to do here, is to work hard for the Lord. To work hard and serve him in every way. And as we do that, we do so with the eye knowing that Jesus is going to return one day for us. And when he comes back, I hope that he finds me working hard for the kingdom. And so Peter is encouraging the people like he did uh, a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the uh, beginning verses. He's encouraging the people to live godly and holy lives. And I think we do that by keeping our eyes fixed on the truth that Jesus is coming back for us one day. So first, the first point is that we need to wake up to the truth of Christ's return. We need to wake up to the truth of of Christ's return in those first three verses in 12 through 15. Three different times Peter tells them he's reminding them or he wants them to remember. He says, I'm going to remind you and I'm going to remind you again. And after I'm gone, I want to have reminded you so much that you can recall it at any time. He's reminding them, but what is he reminding them of? In verse 12, it says, I remind you of these qualities. 
What is he talking about? I think he's talking about verses 3 through 11. And if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago when we went through that, uh, verses 3 and 4, he tells us that we have everything we need for life and godliness. He says we've been given the Holy Spirit, we've been given the power, and now we are to live holy lives. He tells us the incentive for serving and living a godly life is the grace that we've received in Jesus Christ found in verses 5 through 8. And then in verses 9 through 11, he tells us that life and godliness is necessary for eternal life. Look at verse 11. If you just go back, I don't have it on the slide, but go back in your uh, Bible to verse 11 of chapter 1. He says this, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter does not want to fix the Christian's eyes on what is happening in this world. We don't need to look to this world to motivate us for Christian living. We don't need to get a checklist and say, I'm just going to do this and do right and keep all these moral laws. But what he does is he fixes their eyes on heaven, on the eternity of heaven and knowing that Jesus will return to get us. And that is our motivation. A little bit of context for this book. Peter is writing to refute false teachers. He's writing this book to refute false teachers. And one of the main things the false teachers of that day were saying is that Jesus isn't coming back. They were saying, we're looking around at the world. We're looking around and day after day comes. Nothing ever changes. You keep saying he's returning. But guess what? He's not. And that's what the false teachers were saying. And it led to a couple of implications. They believed in Jesus. But they said this, if Jesus isn't coming back, and if Jesus has died for our sins, then you can really live however you want. Because his grace covers our sins, right? If Jesus has died for us, then you don't need to live a holy life. You don't need to live a godly life because Jesus' grace covers your sin. And while that is true, it is still false teaching, and I think it still cheapens the grace of God. It cheapens his grace when we say, yeah, you have saved me, but I'm not going to follow after you in any way. I'm just going to rely upon your grace. And I think Paul in Romans chapter 6 believed the same thing. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? His answer, by no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Paul says We cheapen the grace of God when we proclaim, yes, I've received the grace of God, but my life doesn't show. I've received the grace of God. His blood covers my sins, but I don't want to change my life in any way. I don't want to do anything different than what I've done. No, if Jesus has changed you, that grace should lead to fruit. It should lead to a transformed life. So these false teachers were teaching this. They were also teaching that you can have a knowledge of God, but it doesn't have to result in holy living. They claimed, hey, I know God. And I think in our culture, we see this too. We see people who say, yeah, I know Jesus. My family's gone to church there for a long time. When I was a kid, when I was six years old, I made a profession of faith. I was baptized. I know Jesus. They know all the Bible stories. They know everything they need to know, but they know him up here, but they've never had a heart change. They've claimed to know Jesus, but for 30, 40 years, they've never lived for him. They know Jesus, but they haven't been changed by Jesus. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John speaks to this type of person. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I think that's a powerful thing for us today, especially in America, in the Bible Belt. In the midst of cultural, cre- cultural Christianity, we can come and we can say, I know God. I know Jesus. I've gone to church here my whole life. We can know about God, but not know God. He says, if you know me, you'll keep my commandments. Your life will look different. So, look, these are the false teachers. This is what they were saying. And this is what Peter tells to encourage in the midst of these false teachers. Look at verse 12 again. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Who is he writing to here? Christians. 
Christians who don't just know him with their lips, but they truly know him. He says they are established in the truth. So why would he need to remind them if they are already rooted and established in the truth? Well, it's the same reason that we gather together every Sunday to worship Jesus, to encourage one another, because we are forgetful people. And we need to be reminded of the truth over and over again. And just as we need to be reminded, there are false teachers out there who are trying to pull people away. They are trying to cheapen God's grace. They are trying to distort the Bible. And we need to be reminded day in, day out, no matter how long you have come to church, no matter how many times you've read through the Bible, we need to be reminded of the grace of God and that Jesus is coming back for us. Then I think he gets to the main point in these three verses in verse 13. Look at what it says. I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. This word, to stir you up here, it's a pretty harsh word. I don't want, maybe not harsh, but aggressive word, a strong word. Another way to uh, translate it would be to wake up someone. Like if you were going to someone in the middle of the night, you were grabbing by the shoulders and wake them up. That's what he says. I want to wake you up by way of reminder. In uh, a few years ago, in 2018, I don't know if you remember this news story, but in Hawaii, there were people who were going about their day and they were doing their life. And then all of a sudden they got a text alert from the government and it was from the state of Hawaii. And it said this. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. So they got that text to their phone, and there was a nuclear warhead coming for them. Right? And for 38 minutes, people were scrambling. People left their jobs. They left whatever they were doing. They were trying to find shelter. They were trying to find their loved ones. For 38 minutes, they did that. And then the government issued a correction. And essentially, someone had pressed the wrong button, and it was a false alarm. Do y'all remember that? Wouldn't you hate to be that person? Apparently, they picked the wrong drop-down list. They were just going through clicking. They picked the wrong drop-down list. But think about the people. How many text messages they would have gotten that day, looked at it, put it down. Looked at it, put it down. It affects their life in no way at all. But then they get this message, and what do they do? It wakes them up. It changes things. And that's what Peter's saying here. I want to wake you up. I don't want you just to keep going through the motions, keep showing up to church. I want to wake you up by way of reminder that Jesus is coming back and it should cause us to change our life. It should cause us to change our life. It's also interesting what he says in verse 13 and 14. I think it right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. If you uh, have a Bible and it might have a little number, my Bible has a little number to the uh, top of the word body there. You can go down and look at the bottom and it'll tell you another way that Greek word would be translated. That word body is also translated as tent. It's interesting that Peter uses his this word for his body and his life as a tent. He says that I as long as I'm in this tent of a body Because I know that the putting off of my tent will be soon. What is a tent? It is temporary, right? It's not meant to last forever. I know some people, they love going to the mountains. They love getting a tent out, putting it up, setting up, camping, sleeping in the tent for a few days. And those people are crazy. (laughs) I've been camping. It's not comfortable in a tent, right? I've been in a tent and it's rained and it's leaked in and it's, it's not pleasant, right? The reason I sleep in the tent is to remember how great my bed is back home, right? And so he's saying here, this life that we are living is transitory, it's temporary, it's not going to last forever, but we should be using this life to look forward to our real home in heaven. He's saying we are on this journey, and imagine if you were hiking, and you were going camping, and you have your tent, and you put your tent out, and you sleep in it, and you keep going, and in life... We are transitioning. We are marching towards heaven. There will be good days where the weather's fine. There will be uh, bad days where the weather's not so great. We'll be up on top of a mountain. We'll be down in hills and valleys. This life is transitory, but we should be longing for our home in heaven, where our bed is, where our mansion is. And he tells them this. He says, I'm going to be gone, 
But you need to remember that Jesus is coming back, that we don't need to worship this life and everything we have here. But if Christ is coming, then this life we live now should be for him, not for ourselves. And so he wants to wake people up to the truth of Christ's return. Secondly, he wants them to fix their eyes, fix your eyes on the glory of Christ's return. For us, we need to fix your eyes on the glory of Christ's return. He tells them, remember that Jesus is coming, wake up, and then he gives us two sources to remember, two ways that we can remember this uh, glorious truth. The first way is by our own experience and by the apostles' experience, and the second way is by the word of God. So first, look at verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord and Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. People of that day, the false teachers, were saying, hey, you just made all this stuff up. It's not real. It's not true. It's a, it's a myth. It's cleverly devised to pull people away. But ultimately, Jesus is not true. And Peter is speaking back against them. And he says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We're not just making this up, but we were there. We saw Jesus. We saw the miracles. We saw the resurrection. Look at verse 17. For when he had received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, For we were with him on that holy mountain. The event that Peter is talking about here is the transfiguration. If you remember in the Gospels, Peter, James, and John, they went on top of a mountain with Jesus. And while they were up there, Jesus was transfigured and they saw him in his glory for who he was. And Elijah and Moses met him there. And it was this affirmation of Jesus that he was the son of God. And God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. This is what he's talking about. And he says, you can tell me that I'm making all this stuff up. You can tell me it's a myth, but I've seen his glory on that mountain. When we experience Jesus, it should cause us to remember. It should cause us to be changed. I recently had lunch this week uh, with uh, a gentleman, and he was telling me about his salvation experience. He says, I wasn't living for the Lord. I did not know Jesus. He said, but I had a co-worker. And that co-worker uh, be- uh, became a Christian. And after he became a Christian, his life was completely changed. And that co-worker would come in every day, and he would say, man, I've, just, I've encountered Jesus. I've encountered the living God, and it's changed me. And after weeks and weeks of going to work and seeing the changed life and seeing the joy on that person's face, this guy that I was having lunch with said, I saw him and I wanted to have that. I saw where he had experienced Jesus and I wanted to experience him as well. And that is what led him to faith in Jesus Christ. And so if we want to live a holy and godly life, We should fix our eyes on the glory of Christ's return. We should focus our eyes that Christ meets us here. But when we meet Christ here, Paul says it is like in a mirror dimly lit. We only see a little bit of God's glory. But on that mountain that Peter talks about, he saw Jesus in his full glory. And one day when Jesus returns... We won't see him through a mirror dimly, but we will see him in his full glory. And as we look forward to and anticipate that day, it should cause us to live holy and godly lives. So we need to wake up to the truth of Christ's return. We need to fix our eyes on the glory of Christ's return. And finally, we need to trust the word to illuminate the truth of Christ's return. Trust the word to illuminate the truth of Christ's return. Look at verse 19. He just talked about his experience of meeting Jesus, seeing him in his glory, and look at verse 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. Did you catch that? He just talked about his experience of seeing God, experiencing God, and he says, And we have something, the word of God, which is more fully confirmed than even our own experience. 
The word of God is more powerful than even our own experiences. This passage is one of the uh, passages that we would go to to look for the inerrancy of Scripture. Here at Shady Grove Baptist Church, we believe that God's word is God's word, that it is without error, and that it is for our instruction for life and godliness, and we will hold to God's word. There are many in our culture today who will say that the Bible is a good book, it's a moral book, it helps us in some way, but it really should have some updating. There's some things in here that aren't really right for our culture and our time, and so we should update the Bible. We should change some verses, we should take out some verses that might be problematic. And all of those people will claim this, but we shouldn't take out verses from the Bible. We shouldn't change the Bible because it is the very words of God. Look at verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What is Peter saying here? He's saying the words in this book are not just a bunch of dead men's opinions, but they are the living God's word to us. And that if he has spoken it, he used men to write it, but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And if we have this word, then we should seek to align our lives to this word. We should change everything about our life to make sure it matches up with God's word. Not only that, but it should be a light to us. Look again at verse 19. To which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In 1954, the future Apollo 13 uh, pilot, Jim Lovell, was a, a Navy pilot at the time, and he was training off the coast of Japan. And he was uh, taking off from a ship. He was taking his airplane off of a ship, and he went up, and he got going in the air. And uh, after a little bit, at night, all of his instruments went out. And so he's looking, and everything is dark on the inside. He begins looking outside of the cockpit to see if he can see anything, and there is nothing but darkness. He is over the ocean, and he is thinking, I, am, I have nowhere to land. I don't know uh, where the aircraft carrier is, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And as he was circling around, he began to see this faint blue-green light in the ocean. And when he saw it, he knew exactly what it was. It was something called phosphorescent algae. And as the uh, ship had been gone where he was going to land on, that ship, as it had went by, it had stirred up this phosphorescent algae and it was glowing in the sea. And he followed that phosphorescent algae back to the ship where he could land on that aircraft carrier. And he said later that that light saved his life. As he looked out, there was nothing but darkness, but as he followed that light, it led him back to where he could land. Our world is getting increasingly darker, isn't it? There's more pain, there's more sickness, there's more suffering. For all the advancements that we have in the world, it seems like the world is becoming a darker and darker place. But Christian, take heart. As the world gets darker, the word of God gets brighter. And we have the light of the word to guide us in these dark times. If you'll go back to my camping analogy, imagine you were hiking and we are on this life, and we are journeying through the woods, hiking, and it is nighttime, and we have a lamp, and we can't see far ahead, but we can see just enough to take the next step. We can see just enough to take the next step as we are going along. That is what the Word of God is for us. It helps us to see our next step. We can't see everything else, but it helps us take steps towards Jesus. But eventually, what comes after the night? The sunrise. Look at verse 19 again. You will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We're walking around in the darkness right now. All we have is a lamp, but one day Jesus will return and he will be the light to illuminate everything. He will be the light that will return and it will cause us to rejoice. It will come with the restoration of all things. And so if we want to live holy and godly lives, live for Jesus, 
then we need to trust the word to illuminate the fact that Jesus is coming back for us one day. I'll close with this. Jesus is coming back, and there are two responses that we could have when he does come back. The first response is joy, because Jesus will welcome in the saints into the kingdom. Right? When the light of Jesus shines, when he returns, it will restore all things. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. He will bring us into his family. There will be no more tears. There will be no more weeping. We will be united with him perfectly forever. But there is also another response. When Jesus returns, that same light that will bring restoration will also illuminate all of the sin and sickness in our hearts. And if we are not found to be in Christ, it will result in judgment for us. Not just judgment, but eternal damnation in hell for eternity. So I ask you today, Jesus is coming back. So how will you live? Jesus is going to return one day. How do you want him to find you? If you are a Christian here today, I encourage you to work hard for the Lord. Work hard for his kingdom. Look to the light of the word to guide you. And if you are not a Christian today, I encourage you to turn to Jesus. Your efforts and your working do not earn your salvation. But only through the grace of Jesus Christ can you find forgiveness of your sins. And I encourage you, Jesus is coming. Would you repent and believe in him today? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Asking that you'd help us. Help us remember. We are so quick to forget, Lord. We are so quick to be pulled astray by every false doctrine and false teaching. But Lord, I pray that you would focus us on your word. That you would help us to remember your word, to trust your word, to guide us. As we look forward to that day when Christ will return. And Lord, I pray if there is someone here today who says, Lord, I'm not living for you. I might know you in my mind. I might confess you with my lips, but Lord, I've never had my life changed by you. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would work on that person. And Lord, that you would give them new life today in repentance and faith. We ask this in Jesus' name.